Hey, my name is Ash and from All Things Dentistry and welcome to this free mandibular, mandibular molar access video. And with it, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through kind of the overview of the, of the access process, the radiograph, and then we're going to get right into it. Now, this, this access video is a little bit longer than I would expect it to be normally. And the reason why is because this, this was actually a patient of mine and we, we managed the patient clinically while we extracted the tooth. So we kind of, we're going to go over some pieces that I think are lost when we talk about cracked teeth and access and all this other stuff. So let's get into it. So the patient presented about two weeks ago, he was symptomatic with coronavirus. It's very, it's, I can't believe I'm talking about coronavirus still, but it's January, 2022, but he presented with symptoms of coronavirus about two weeks ago, so we couldn't treat him. So we provided palliative care, just medications, uh, because his tooth was diagnosed as symptomatic irreversible pitis, so symptomatic apical periodontitis, tooth number four, seven. And then we saw him he, later on, he became asymptomatic, got a COVID, negative COVID test. So we had him in the clinic and we diagnosed the tooth as necrotic with symptomatic able periodontitis. And what we're going to do is you, there's another video that we're going to go over the entire cleaning and shaping process and actually the extraction and the clinical exam of the tooth. If you want to see that, you can go ahead and check out, check that video out. But here we are, the extraction the tooth. Now we're ready to practice some endo on it. And what a, you know, what a better situation than practice our endo, uh, endo access on it. So here we have tooth number four, seven. This is the buccal. This is the lingual, the mesial, and you can see the amalgam was fractured and we have a distal marginal ridge fracture. Now, when I have a case that presents with this is this exact situation, the first thing that goes through my mind, if the patient's symptomatic on this tooth, is it fractured? That's the first thing. And sure enough, it was. So, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to well, we extracted the tooth. Prognosis was honestly poor. So for our endo access, if we jump, skip ahead and do our endo access, what we're looking for is we're going to be doing some sort of sort of a rectangle rather than kind of the triangular funnel shape. And the reason why is one of the most common missed canals is the distal lingual. I've seen it miss so many times. And honestly, it's just because we need to extend this a little bit just this way. And it's easy in this case for me to say, just extend it because we have an open pulp chamber and it's really easy to use our endo zebra. If you don't, if you're not familiar with that, you will be in just a few minutes, use our endo zebra to design our pulp chamber. But it's not that simple to, to do when say, for example, part, this part of the tooth has been irritated for years and it becomes calcified. The pulp becomes calcified in that area right here. And then you're not able to use that endo zebra. You have to use, uh, slow round burrs. So you need, so what am I saying? Well, you still need to kind of work to use high magnification to kind of chip away and try to make this so it's more square. So you can see if there is indeed a distal lingual canal hiding under some sort of calcification. Anyways, this is what we're aiming for today. So we're going to be, we have our extracted tooth. We're going to remove the entire restoration. And then what that does is allows, it facilitates us to be able to see if there's a fracture from mesial to distal, which there was, no surprise. But in real life, you may not know that. You may see this and you'd be like, eh, distal marginal ridge, not, you know, not a deep probing depth. You know what? We're going to do the endodontic therapy or we're going to do a restoration, whatever the case is. But you need to remove all of the restoration to see if there is a crack underneath it indeed. And I think part of, even my own experience is like, I need to make the smallest access as possible so I can post it on Facebook. The problem with that is that then you miss some of these other indicators like cracks. So you can still make your small access, just remove all the restoration. It actually makes it easier because there's no amalgam to monkey with your, with your file and your apex locator. So this is our access. You can see it here. We have our mesial buccal, our mesial lingual, and our distal canals hiding under right here. And I've left the mesial part of the amalgam. Now I would normally do that in real life. And there's two reasons why one, if I'm going to place, say, for example, this was a good end and you know, the tooth with prognosis was great. What I'm going to do is the next step is probably a crown restoration. So I'm going to remove, this is, this would be the box. This is the mesial marginal ridge. I'd probably remove a little more of this, this right here in the box and then place my core restoration. And then I don't have to place some sort of matrix or whatnot, because the next stage would be just prepping this out. So I'd make this super thin, like almost like right here and use it as my matrix because 
potentially I'm not going to be, if I finish the one step endo and at this one appointment, I'm not going to be doing the, well, if you're, a, you know, if you're really fast <laughs> cutting, doing your one step endo and cutting your crown on the same day, like, wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I can't do that. So we'll be, I'll be thinning this out using this as a matrix for, to place my core restoration, whether it's an amalgam or composite, and then you're off. The other thing is what I'm doing is that when we, if I remove this, then I have an open, you know, it's more difficult to keep my sodium epichlorite kind of enclosed in the tooth. So I'll just keep this as part of my barrier, my secondary, my primary barrier to keep my sodium epichlorite in the tooth and my, you know, any of the saliva, whatnot out of the tooth and hemorrhage products. Anyways, enough talking. Let's get into the access. Okay, so let's get started. Here's our tooth, and let's go ahead, and we're just going to take a look around them because it's an extracted tooth. I know you're here for an access, but let's just take a look. We have the opportunity. I love extracted teeth because there's so many lessons to be learned. So here's a fracture. You can see the distal marginal ridge, and the mandibular second molar is really one of the most common, or if not the common, most common tooth to be fractured in the mouth. And you can see here's the extent of the fracture. Now, I just extracted this tooth about two days ago. And we placed it in sodium epichloride, so all of the soft tissue is now uh, resorbed. So one of the things you can do, and I'm going to do it here, and I'm actually going to do this when I remove the restoration as well. It's placing the methylene blue dye. So if you don't have this and you're doing a lot of endo, let me just turn that off. Doing a lot of endo, you might want to use this because it's helpful to identify cracks in teeth. And then look at this. Wow. You can see it here, but then it extends it right down to that point right there. So that tooth presented as necros. It actually, the week prior, the patient had symptom, symptoms of coronavirus, so you couldn't see them in the clinic. And the tooth was irreversibly inflamed. There it is in all its glory. And the tooth was, the patient had symptoms, so you couldn't see him until he became symptom, asymptomatic with, um, with a negative COVID test. And then we were able to see the patient. And in that time, the tooth had necrosed. And then, so here we are now. Now, you know, when I... I have another video that's going to talk, it's going to show you the probing depths and how we achieve the probing depths. But certainly when you have a tooth with probing depth of this magnitude, and also it's an isolated probing depth, and also the tooth was across, the prognosis is very poor. So I've tried to save these teeth a few here and there because the patient was really hoping for it. But honestly, um, I've learned now that it's just not worth it. So what we're going to do, and you can see he fractured the, the amalgam as well, which is pretty darn impressive. I haven't seen that a lot. So with extracted teeth, you know, I, I love, I know this is an access video, and I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time just to kind of go over the, the anatomy because it's so variable, and it's just incredible. It's like artwork. I know I'm starting to sound a little crazy. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to take the methylene blue dye, and I'm going to stain the mesial root. And you can see here we've actually got three portals of exit. Because you always think right there. So you can see one, two, three. I couldn't find any others. And then we've got uh, a single on the distal. And, you know, we always think of, you know, the portals of exit as like two dots and that's it. But it's so random on teeth. So when you're doing extracted teeth, if you are going to get an ex doing practicing extracted teeth, which I highly recommend, take a look. Take your time to kind of take a look all over. So we're going to start our access, and remember, we're going to kind of do like that rectangle. And I'm, I used to start really close to the mesial marginal ridge, and then I perforated. This is in like my third year of practice, and I didn't do that again. So what I do is I kind of looked at where the, the, the buccal cusps are, or the mesial cusps are, and I kind of stay, you know, kind of right around that area. And I'm aiming kind of more for the middle of the tooth. Now, Deutsch the Music Can't came out with a great article that talks about the length of the burr, or sorry, the length from the mesobuccal cusp to the roof of the pulp chamber and all maxillary and mandibular molars. So we're going to be checking that little tip out here. But right up front, what I'm going to do, especially with teeth that I suspect are fractured, I'm going to remove all the restoration. I'm, not, I'm trying to minimize the amount of removing of the tooth structure. But we're going to remove all the restoration, because we're going to look for a fracture. Say, for example, we see a little bit of a marginal ridge fracture, which we see all the time, but not often does it go across, you know, not, I wouldn't say often, but not all the time, 100%, how about that? Not 100% of the time does it does a fracture line cross the tooth from mesial distal. But removing all the fracture, sorry, removing all the restoration is actually a great opportunity for you able to see if the fracture does extend, and it does in this case. Because the problem is, and what happens is, we get so tied up and excited on 
doing you know such a conservative access just like instagram that we cut this little preparation but we actually don't see the rest of the landscape to see if it's actually fractured so here we are we're going to wet the tooth you can see the fracture it's a little bit hard to see because of the staining from the amalgam but this is the fracture all the way across now when i see that in a clinical case say for example the patient didn't have a deep probing depth and the patient had a vital tooth and was irreversibly inflamed and we believe it's from the fracture, we'll still continue with the endo, but I've had the discussion in advance saying that, you know, it might be fractured. Prognosis is, is kind of guarded. Once we get into the tooth, if it's still vital, even necrotic, it might be okay. I'll take you, we'll look with the microscope or some sort of high magnification and even the staining to see how far down the canals we can see if the fracture goes. So I appreciate your patience. I know this is a strictly an access video, but I really wanted to, I'm trying to make these access videos more clinically appropriate or just because it's, you know, it's more like real life because I can show you a really quick, like, okay, here, just cut here, boop, 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 but it doesn't, you know, it's, I find that there's a lot of other things that as a clinician are helpful in our judgment. So what you can do, and it's not gonna, it doesn't show up very well in this video, I'm sorry, is that you can stain the tooth, you know, if even well, kind of, you can kind of see it here, it usually will stain blue. So if, say for example, there was a composite in here, it wasn't stained from the amalgam and you stained it, you stain it with a methylene blue dye, it'll, it'll just like pop out and you'll be able to see it. But you can't really see it, but again, you can see it right there. And this is a great, you know, if it does pop up, it's a great opportunity to take a photo with whatever tools you have, whatever uh, camera, image imaging system you have to take a picture and show the patient because then they can have a better understanding like oh yes there's a fracture in my tooth that makes way more sense why it's symptomatic and then what the prog why the prognosis is what it is so what we're going to do here and i apologize it's just a little bit out of out of zoom uh, out of focus i'm using uh, I actually use my iphone to capture this now through my microscope so it has an autofocus so it comes in and out so what we're doing here is I'm just going to make that little box like we talked about. I'm using a long shank number four round. See, I'm not extending all the way across. This is a great shot right here. That's really important for me. This is my quantitative measure. So from the tip of the bird to where the shank changes, you can see it right here is six millimeters. Critical number. And what that does is at six millimeters, Deutsche Music Camp found that that's the top of the roof, the pulp chamber. So you can see I'm slowly doing the outline. Uh, with my number four long surgical burr and we're using a long surgical burr. There we go. It gets back in focus So you can see the fracture goes right in and what I have found and I haven't found any literature on this But this is just from thousands of cases is that right before I get to the pulp chamber the dentin turns white Like super white just like this you can see kind of I don't really see you can't see it here. So That's been my experience like if you're going into a no-go zone turns white and then there's also, if you're getting into the roof, the pulp chamber, it turns white. So you're kind of like, mm. so when I see that, I'm like, okay, all right, fair enough. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my outline, which is that little rectangle. And I'm, I'm always looking in the side of my mirror to see how deep I am. This is an open pulp chamber. So it's a pretty straightforward case because we're going to use, you'll see our endo zebra. But what I just did there is I switched to a number round, number two round surgical burr, which gives me a little bit more of a, a precision. So I don't burn through, you know, make the whole, the axis big, large. And then you can see right there, boom, pop right in and that's it. And we, we know that that's going to happen. We've already predicted it because we have a large open pulp chamber. Now, if the pulp chamber was constricted, you're not going to get that like drop. I didn't, you don't, you didn't see me get a drop here because I was, you know, I had it right in my hands. I could see what was going on. Um, but clinically, I would have expected a drop. So what I've done here is we've maintained kind of all the enamel. And you don't need to, you know, we want to have straight line access. If you're just brand new at doing root canals, you know, you're going to, you know, you may want to do your outline just a little bit bigger, especially on extracted teeth. Don't be afraid to make your access bigger than it needs to be. So you can kind of judge and get a feel for what uh, you need to do to be able to see. And then slowly with time, you can make it a little bit smaller. The problem with making smaller access is that you miss things. So let's just speed up here. The tooth is a little bit, a little, little alone. Okay, now we're back in. So this is our endo zebra end cutting, non-end, non-cutting tip. We're going to place that in there. And for the video, what I've done is I've actually slowed it down and I'm not using any water. So normally in a patient, I'll be using water. It'd be lots of water and I'll have it spinning at 200,000 RPM. But here I've slowed it down just so it doesn't get all crazy. Uh, it's easier to video. 
So what I'm doing is I'm using the tip of the burr to run around the bottom of the pulp chamber. And you can see that actually in our root canal, like an, like an endodontis course, you'll see actually this in action with some clear teeth. It's really helpful. So what I'm doing here is I'm just letting the tip of that burr follow the, the, the floor of the pulp chamber. And because it's, it's really easy to do on an extracted tooth, so you can kind of see what you're doing. In real life, you can't really see what the head of the handpiece is in the way. And, you know, maybe I should think about, like, saying maybe we need longer burrs of these so I can see what's going on. So there we go. We've cleaned out. I've taken my air water syringe. I've removed all of the debris. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our side vented irrigating needle with full strength sodium hypochlorite. Actually, I'm lying. In on our in our just our tabletop stuff, we're just using like one percent sodium hypochlorite. But in real life, we'll use full strength. And here you can see what we've done is this is where our so this is our mesial buccal cusp. This is our mesial lingual. We can see now our mesial lingual orifice. It's, you have to tip the tooth a little bit. There's a mesial lingual orifice and there's our distal. So this is the size that I usually go for. It's no smaller, no larger. And okay, so there's that fracture line. So what we're gonna do, so this is the size of the axis and we're gonna keep going here just a little bit. Just we're gonna take a look and see if we can see that fracture down the distal canal. Cause I wanna give you the opportunity to kind of see what it looks like. Cause we see what it looks like on the outside of the tooth. Let's take a look at what it looks on the, on the, down the distal canal. So you can see here, we've got that margin fracture Distal margin, a ridge fracture, it kind of goes along the distal and then it goes right down here. And it actually, you can't see it. It's too hard to get. There's no, the lighting's not good enough, but there is actually, the fracture continues down to about here in the distal canal. You know, in my experience, if I see a fracture and it kind of stops about here, then I'm like, I'll tell the patient, okay, I think we're good to go. Our prognosis is guarded, but I think we'll have success. You may have, you know, you've got your tooth maybe for five years if we have a cuspal coverage restoration on it. But if it's necrotic and it continues, like ew, prognosis very poor. Because what I found, oh, you can see the fracture down there. What I found is that even if you do the pulpectomy, the patient's still going to have pain upon biting. And if that settles down, what you'll see is you'll start getting that. You, you already have a probing depth in a pocket there. It's just going to get worse. Unfortunately, it's just the excuse me the nature of the game with us as humans preserving our teeth longer in our mouth. So there's a, the fracture all the way down there, you can see. And it probably continues, you know, as a micro crack, we probably can't even see it. It continues further down. And let's see, there's our access. So we've stained it. I'll turn that sideways. Sorry, I was just doing this for Instagram. Okay, so again, you can see we've maintained, oh yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. It actually spins, I'm gonna angle it. So there's our distal canal. And we're going to angle it just so you can see our, there's our fracture again. And then <clears throat> we're going to see our mesial canals. I should have cut this out actually. There it is right there. So there's our mesial buccal canal. There's our mesial lingual. And we just have enough as we turn our, our intraorally, we'll just turn our mirror just a little bit to be able to see it. And then we're good. So if you want to see the rest of the axe or rest of the, continuation of cleaning and shaping, working length development and whatnot, go ahead and click on the next video. And if you want to see the extraction and whatnot, that's included in the video as a bonus. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm super excited. We've got a whole bunch of other free endodontic access cases that maybe aren't as involved because I didn't extract them. They're just more from a jar of teeth, but they're gonna, we're going to go over the access and we'll actually we'll throw my clinical spin on it from experience. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to check us out at allthingsendo.ca. Cheers.